Your story is waiting for you today. Your story has something new to say. But your story will only come out to play when you're alone. Alone. Alone in a room with invisible people. The following episode may contain swearing. Alone in a Room with Invisible People is brought to you by hollyswritingclasses.com. Hi, I'm Rebecca Gallardo, the host of Alone in a Room with Invisible People. I'm here with author and teacher Holly Lyle, and today's topic is going full-time as a writer, insanity helps. (laughs) I like the little extra thing there that you added at the end, Mom. (laughs) So um, as as we normally do, we're going to go ahead and get to how our week went. So you start off. Okay. um, Overall, really, really, really good week. Uh, I finished and published The Owner's Tale. I finished and published The Longview Chronicles, which is the entire six-book boxed set series. Um, I got Lesson 14 done in How to Write a Novel, which was Transitions. Um, I... I'm probably going to start on Lesson 15 today, even though it's a Sunday. And um, I am starting on Moon and Sun 3, The Emerald Sun, which is the third and final book in the Moon and Sun series, which I started back in 2006 with Scholastic. And then uh, I did the second book, which was The Ruby Key. No, the first book was, sorry, The Ruby Key. The second book. Say. <laughs> yes. Yes, the second book was The Silver Door, and then uh, things happened. And yeah. uh, now, and so I am going to be writing and indie publishing The Emerald Sun. Um, oh, wow, which, which makes me think of uh, my Patreon, which uh, it has it, it, this being Christmas and. You know that time of year, it, we are dropping right down to the minimum funding level, and I'm I'm a tiny bit freaked about that. But it's <laughs> okay. Anyway. So this is all right, and we haven't mentioned this before, so this is actually a good time to 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 mention that we most of the time, you know, we we don't mention um, Holly's personal stuff just because this is we're trying to keep the alone in a room with invisible people thing as a separate thing but holly actually has a patreon and the patrons that um like are supporting her are actually funding her fiction and i didn't realize that it but it makes sense because this time of year you know everybody's like super tight everybody Yeah. yeah but if you're interested in helping fund her fiction uh, you can either go obviously buy her fiction, which would be like um, the Longview Chronicles. If mm-hmm. you can buy any of those, that would help. But if you're interested in becoming a patron for her, it's uh, w- what are your levels? Uh, one dollar, two dollars, and five dollars. Wow, that's really low. Okay, so one dollar, <laughs> two two dollars, or five five dollars, and, and that that gets you um, a one chapter a month of whatever it is I'm working on for the first level, one chapter, another chapter a month for whatever I'm I'm working on. And then the third level gets you a a video of me actually doing the writing and the third chapter of whatever I'm doing. Or it's, it's, it's basically more scenes than chapters because sometimes chapters get very long, but it's, it's it's coherent chunks of live, you know, current fiction that I'm working on in first draft. And that, full, so they get the entire book in first draft before yeah. almost, or how does yeah. that work? It, it kind of, it depends because um, as I, I sometimes produce stuff faster than I can put it in the patron, in the, in the Patreon. Yeah. <laughs> so they get whatever, whatever it is that I'm working on that month. And okay. sometimes if I get, you know, if I get... Uh, busy <laughs> and get just a shitload of stuff done then they get the first part of the next project and stuff but they also you know um well, the, I, I i try to make it cool <laughs> yeah well the point of it is to show people the first draft and then mm-hmm. they can see you know after it's revised and everything so so they they can see the differences too i like that um so yeah, and I I have an idea too. Like, if you guys have any ideas on what you would like to see on Holly's Patreon that doesn't 
actually cause her to create any additional work because she doesn't actually have that much time. Uh, when it comes to her fiction, if you have any ideas of what you'd actually like to see with her fiction, um, just, you know, let us know. Uh, you can drop an email at uh, show at alone with invisible people, or you can just go to Holly's patron page if you'll um, actually do join as a patron. Just you can comment on there. But yeah, that, that would be a cool way to sort of it, it's supporting the podcast in a way because you're supporting one of the hosts and also you know go buy longview chronicles <laughs> yes. i gotta say i mean especially if, if you're a new listener and you haven't read any of holly or anything like that it's a great way to get an idea of um her style her genre her fiction her well one of them. yeah well, yeah one of she's, my genres. <laughs> she's widely um varied with the different genres and everything so yeah so um <laughs> anything else for this week no no that was pretty much that it was a, that big was week. a lot yeah <laughs> that's a lot that's for a lot. one week <laughs> how about you well i got i think i got one day in of writing and then the shit hit the fan and oh god because of the cat yeah it wasn't oh, even yeah. just the cat it's like i went to the therapy session and we talked and it had been a really rough week and then i get back home and some of the scheduling has changed for us so i had to rush and get everything done i had to do errands we had to double check on our um animal babysitter for when we do take our trip and then i have to get everything ready for her and then Wednesday, it was actually Tuesday night, Jeeves started showing signs of not being well. And um, basically, he he was, he apparently he wasn't dehydrated, but he seemed dehydrated. He wasn't going to the bathroom, he was meowing, it, 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 it was not good. And then he just didn't have the energy or anything. And Wednesday, like I told Tony, I'm like, I have to take him to the vet. And even Tony could see in the way he was acting, like he laid, it looked like he was trying to pee on everything, but he couldn't pee on anything. And Tony was so concerned that he said, don't lock him in the bathroom. Just let him go. And if he pees on something, we'll just get rid of it or we'll clean it or something like that. And Tony is so anti cat peeing in the house. <laughs> well, yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, understand that. Yeah, I, I don't get it because I have chronic anosmia since birth, if you guys don't know. So I have never been able to smell anything. But it's like apparently a really, really bad smell. <laughs> and, <laughs> Not and, good. Yeah. Tony used to be anti-cat. He he cares so much about the cat. Like when he said that, like he's like, don't worry about it. We'll just, we'll take care of it if it happens. I was like, who the fuck are you? <laughs> like... <laughs> pod person are you still my <laughs> husband <laughs> but yeah he he that showed me how much he cared about Jeeves and he was like I I could see in his demeanor too how worried he was so the cat ended up costing more than eight hundred dollars mm -hmm. and that makes it the second most expensive cat that I've ever had that has ever been mine because yeah. Grey Mouser I know broke her leg twice the first time because of your ex and the second time because of her she was pulling out the pins or something yeah, yeah. <laughs> my poor kitty but yeah so uh but he is he's back home i am monitoring him making sure that he has a good uh energy level and and appetite but that was so stressful and i didn't even realize how much my body was like taking on until he came home and he was trying to cuddle with me and everything and, and and he was okay and i just kept like for two days i kept feeling these waves of it's okay or these waves of relaxation yeah and i lost um <clears throat> a rescue dog two years ago the day after christmas so i was already having some conscious fears about this kind of shit. <laughs> right right yeah yeah that's <laughs> That's one of those things where life just sometimes falls on your head. What do yeah. you do? <laughs> yeah. And there was all this other shit that I had to get done. I had deadlines. I had I just, it was an insane week. But I know I got at least one day, I think one or two days of writing in. And um, the write a book with me is going amazing. The 10 minute yes. timer challenge is going amazing. You guys are really just kicking ass and doing everything you can, which inspires me to go in and at least try to get, you know, 10 to 20 to 30 minutes of writing yeah. 
whenever I'll tell I you what, that 10 minute challenge is really looking good in the, yeah. in the, uh, alone in a room with an invisible people form. That's just, yeah. Damn. Yeah. And, and a lot of the people <laughs> hadn't tried it before. Um, and they were talking about how, like, how much it changed their mind. Right. You know? I, I remember <clears throat> one of them in there said, you know, I just, I knew this wasn't going to work for me. Yep. And then it did. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing is like, it, even if you, you know, in your mind, like a lot of people get stubborn and they want to think certain things and there's nothing you can do to change somebody like that. It's, it's, you have to want to be more productive. You have to want, and to me, if you are a writer and if you are a person who wants to do this for a living, <clears throat> your attitude is not going to be, well, that's just the way I am. It's going to be, let me do anything I can to enjoy this process more. Let me do anything I can to be the best writer that I can possibly be. So to me, that would include trying things. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I, I wouldn't say I'm saying that this is the only thing that will work for people. I'm just saying you need to try things. It's, it's like the not editing while you write. Mm-hmm. You need to try the, the <laughs> process of not doing it. It's, it's just, to me, that, that shows how serious you are about being a writer. Yeah. So <laughs> um, yeah. That, was, that was my crazy-ass week and your crazy-ass week. So I guess let's, let's get to the, to the topic because this is, this is an interesting one. It is. It is. And um, also a quick shout out to Jennifer S., who uh, is one of my patrons who specifically requested this topic. Uh, She wanted to know, uh, know, well, first of all, how did I uh, transition from being a nurse to writing full time? But also uh, just how do you write full time? How do you make this happen? And yeah, that's a, it's an important question, and a lot of people have that that question. I know you've talked about it in different places, but and I know you've mentioned a few things here and there on the podcast. But that's mm-hmm. that's something that a lot of people want to know. Well, well, for 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 most of us, I, I well, I don't know. I know for a lot of people, having a regular job and regular security is a big deal, and they want to write as a, a like augmenting, you know, bringing in extra money. But there are a lot of people for whom this is the dream that yeah. you are going to write full time, and uh, having having been writing full time and paying the bills full time since nineteen ninety. One, two, nineteen ninety-two was yeah when I went full time. Um, uh, okay, uh, the, the the title was Insanity Helps, <laughs> <laughs> and Becky Becky's perspective on this is different than mine because she grew up with this insanity. Yes, um, yes, and I, I specifically when you mentioned this topic, I pointed that out. Like, let me explain a few things from my perspective as we go along because Mm -hmm. it's it's going to help I think other people understand certain things yeah yeah and and everybody wants to hear that you're going to write your books they are going to make you a freaking fortune the money is just going to pour on your head like rain from heaven, and everything is going to be okay. Now, see, I don't think everybody wants to hear that, but I do <laughs> think everybody wants to hear that, you know, once you get published, it's going to be easy to get published, that you're going to be able to send in the books that the publisher wants, and that they're going to pay you on a regular, consistent basis, and they're on going time. to, on time, exactly, yes, I was just <laughs> about to say, and they're going to pay you on time, and that as long as you consistently produce produce they will consistently pay that's that's what I would want to hear you know because that's what I want but Mm -hmm. growing up with the 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 (laughs) mother who was a writer I know how bullshit that is (laughs) it's a lovely dream but it's absolutely not realistic oh my god yes (laughs) yeah no um all right so Um, Before we go any further, I need to throw in a financial disclaimer here, okay? I am not an accountant. The I am going to be talking about money, but when, before you do any of this shit, 
you need to talk to an accountant, somebody for whom this, this is reality, getting your stuff, um, getting your, your, getting your ducks in a row, uh, so that you do not just implode, uh, (laughs) because how you, how you make it writing full-time as a fiction writer, if you are not JK Rowling or somebody you've heard of, okay, if you're me, um, it comes down to, well, how good are you at managing money? And you have to be really damn good at managing money. And that's one of the things that I learned from growing up in trailer parks and on mission fields with parents who had almost nothing was how to be good at not managing or how to be good at managing money and and not spending it. (laughs) And that's, that is where we are coming from because that is how I have managed to write full time since 1992 is uh i'm just good at managing money (laughs) yeah and that well a lot of uh okay so i'm gonna mention this right away because i i i want to get this out of the way a lot of people are going to use their family as an excuse not to write not Mm -hmm. to try for a full time not to quit because they're going to say it's quote selfish um if you are interested, look up the definition of selfless. That means no self. <laughs> yeah. um, selfish is not inherently bad. Being self-centered, being self-absorbed, not giving shit about your family, that's different. That's yeah. horrible. That's not but- selfishness. Um, that aside, I can say that it, as long as you are doing everything in your in in your capacity to love your family and to provide your portion of what you need of what you all need to survive you are not being selfish or or not the negative version of selfish that everybody sees i grew up with a mother who was almost always home I, i i am old enough to remember the nursing years Mm -hmm. Um, but I can say that she was always home. She was always there for me that, and of course there's the other half of that where we drove her crazy because we were always, (laughs) you know, she was always home, but I was not a latchkey kid. I never had to worry that there wasn't somebody to take care of problems that happened. You know, um, I think you guys would go out with Joe to, do stuff or you would just go out the two of you guys just for a break um mm-hmm. but that was it. it it was like your little date nights or something yeah. um the, there were times where we were tight yes <laughs> most of the time we were tight but you guys never we never starved we ate very well you know because it, it was cheaper food and mm-hmm. we learned how to make stuff for ourselves but we never starved we never felt lacking you know it's it's like especially as you get older um what you go through these phases of oh i want everything and tv doesn't help because it teaches the kids like oh just tell your parents you want this it's and you have no concept of money so of course we we had things we wanted you know and i wanted to get a lot of stuff because I was a pack rat (laughs) so um but every kid goes through that every every kid that is going to end up well balanced does not get everything they want every time right and I always had clothes that fit I always had food you guys always bought us like books and Mark had a bunch of video games and we both had movies and we were well taken care of and this is on you guys have heard some of Holly's stories of where she was near broke, of where they had almost no money, of where it was ride or die, basically, you know, <laughs> it's like yeah. ride or die, ride or die. So I just want to stay, say this right now. If you are, if you listen to everything Holly says and you take her advice and everything like that and you work really hard and, and you get to the point where you're selling stuff, that is amazing. Don't don't think that you are being a bad person by trying to 
put part of yourself first in your life. Your family should come first and you are part of that family. I think a lot of people miss that. Mm -hmm. And if doing what you love is important to you and it should be, then that's putting your family first because you're a better person for doing it. So uh, my my take on this, my, and I probably might say a couple other things too while Holly talks about some of this, but this is really important. Do not use your family as an excuse not to live your dreams because there's just a lot of resentment that ends up there. I, I would have hated my if my mother had been a nurse this entire time only because, I mean, I respect nurses, got a lot of them in my family, but only because she felt that she couldn't quit because it was selfish, because she had to take care of her kids. She would be resentful, she would be bitter, she would be frustrated. Yeah. So don't yeah, well, use your family as an excuse. I, I'm glad you brought that up because doing this was absolutely selfish. Writing full-time, deciding that I was going to write full-time was absolutely selfish. And what I got out of it was I got to be home with my kids. Yeah. And that was like, and now we told this story. I, I told this story a few weeks ago, or I don't remember the, when the, which podcast it was, but it was, it was because of being a nurse that I realized that I needed to be home with my kids. Yeah. And I, and I owe Anne McCaffrey for this path. Because I had never had any interest in being a writer. Um, I, you know, I was, I wrote pretty well in high school and I considered it sort of a minor, minor skill thing. But Mm -hmm. the idea of writing fiction had never occurred to me. And then I read uh, an interview with Anne McCaffrey, who was a hero of mine. She wrote the Pern stuff and I loved her work. I just fucking loved it. And she said, well, yeah, I, I had never planned to be a writer. It just was a way for me to make some money and stay home with my kids. And this little bell went off in the back of my mind. And I said, yeah, all right then. And that was when I was 24. And that was after that horrible, horrible after realization. The horrible and then yeah. after you saw those in, women with the romance novel. Yeah. The other yeah, nurses. Yeah, that, these, that these two nurses that, that uh, I worked with, or, or they were, we were in nursing school with me. One of them was an LPN. And she was in nursing school with me, and she had a roommate. And the two of them together had written a no- romance novel. And it was, they had the manuscript, and they showed it to me. And I thought, huh, that's just pages. I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just this, this a serendipitous confluence of events that kind of just helped you find what you needed. And yes, sometimes and, life and doesn't do that. but <laughs> No, no, and it just turned out. When I fell into this because Anne McCaffrey said you could make money at it, and I wrote a romance novel, and it was horrible, that I discovered the thing that I loved. Yeah. But that was just a benefit. Even if I hadn't loved it, I would have still kept doing this yeah. because I wanted to be home with my kids. And that, this was the only path I saw to do that. And my understanding of it at the time was that, see, I would write and then I would become Anne McCaffrey, who really did well <laughs> and made a lot of money at this. And that's not me. You know, I will, be, I will be honest up front right now. I do not make a bunch of money from my fiction. Um, and I never have. I, have. I have always been a mid-list writer, which means um, I am the filler, I, I am the pasta that the publisher throws at the wall, and if it sticks, great, and if not, I get three books and I move on to another <laughs> I was publisher. I about to say, you get three <laughs> books worth of, of pasta sticking <clears throat> on the wall. <laughs> yep, and then you move on to another publisher, and that's why I win indie, is because I need to be able to control my worlds, I need to be able to build my audience, and if it takes me time, well, it takes me time. Either the listeners either redefine your vision of selfishness or stop using that word yeah. because this is really, really important stuff. And again, as the child of a writer, I love my life. I, I, you are encouraging your, your family to be creative. You are encouraging them to follow your dreams because, and I have said this for years, even when mom and I didn't get along perfectly because I was, you know, a teenager or I was 20 and I thought I knew a whole bunch of shit about life. 
even even when we didn't get along perfectly all the time, it, it, I always looked at her as a role model. I always told everybody that was a role model. She, if I turned out, because everybody always complains, oh, I don't want to end up like my mother, you know, all these women. <laughs> and to me, I'm like, damn, if I ended up half the person my mother is, I, I just don't want to be as corny as her. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Oh, and I am so proud of you, art and writing, and you kick ass at both. I am just so proud of you. That's a, that's a mom for you. <laughs> but, but yeah, and that's the thing is like, if you want to be a good role model to your kids, you know, you put your family first and you are part of that family and you follow your dreams and you do what you can and you work hard at what you love. And I'm, I'm telling you right now, I, I have seen other parents and, and I, I'm not saying they're bad people. They're, they're probably great people. You know, it's just, I lucked out and got an amazing role model. And as, as the kid of a writer, I would say, you know what, <laughs> go for it because you're going to be a better parent. Cool. Cool. Thank you. It's Thank you. <laughs> a nice thing to hear from your kid. It really is. <laughs> because I know how hard things were and I know how thin things got. So yeah, but anyway, the important things were there. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. And, and we had, even the, the year that we had $25 in the bank before Christmas and Matt hawked his trump, his stuff. trumpet. So yeah. That, yeah. So, so that, that we you had guys presents. could have <laughs> presents. Yeah. And, and then bought you a bunch of, bought Mark a bunch of discount uh, DVDs, uh, movies, and I forget what he got for you. Some, I think he but, got uh, basketball and tennis shoes because I really wanted the tennis shoes. Uh, I don't remember if that was a Christmas present or not. I just remember I was so happy with my new shoes and so proud of them. <laughs> I wanted to wear them all the time, so I took them out and mowed the lawn, and he was very angry about that. Yes, he was. <laughs> I remember that too. <laughs> but, you know, it's just like that disconnect between a kid thinking yeah. and an adult's thinking so yes <laughs> but yes. yeah it's even even when things were tight it's like we understood and it the only reason we had so many problems in the in the in that time was because of the way barry had treated us and barry always had access to money because his parents always gave him money so it's like we thought money was just there you know we didn't mm -hmm. grow up in the right mindset like you did with your parents <laughs> Yeah. You know, in that, in that, not right mindset, but in that financially, oh shit mindset. Yeah. So that took a little bit of adjusting, but yeah, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, so, so to get started here, um, before you even think about writing full time for a living, you have to be writing full time. And this means that whatever job you're doing now, you have to be doing as much work writing now as you intend to do writing full time. Because if you aren't doing that now, people think, well, you know, someday I'm going to quit my job and write full time <laughs> as if that's the order in which you do this. It isn't. It is you have to make the time now to do the writing because you, you, first off, you really need to know what you're getting into. And if people th have this vision of, of just sitting down and words flowing and magic happening because they're free from the day job. Yep. And it, does, it just isn't like that. Um, this is work. It is hard work. Yeah. It and and it is work you have to show up for every day whether you feel like it or not, whether you had a bad previous day or not, whether you have money or not, you have still got to show up and get your butt in the chair and get your fingers on the keyboard and produce your words for the day every day and this is the job. And it it fascinates me how many people imagine themselves as writers but never actually try out the work. <laughs> um, you know, that's like imagining yourself as a skydiver who's never been up in a plane. Um, you got to really make sure that you like falling, falling through nothing <laughs> down to the ground, you know, and hoping the parachute opens before you hit, because that's pretty much a good description of writing fiction full time too. You know, <laughs> jump out of the plane, hope like hell the, the parachute will work. And then, uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Th that's a good thing that you're saying that too because a lot of people think that um if, if once they retire they can write 
or Mm -hmm. once they quit their job then they'll have all this time but but they don't understand like things change and you also have to get in that habit of writing because if you don't if you save it until you quit um then you're going to end up not in the right mindset because you're going to be like oh well this needs to be clean that needs to be done i need to run out and get groceries oh my husband wants me to do seven million things because it's going to happen when when i went from full-time work to an etsy shop that was a big adjustment because you are in charge of your time Uh and you have to go back to that 16 habits bad habits writers have thing and put the writing first yeah because otherwise it's going to get lost it's that is you get up you get your shower if you, you know, if you, you get dressed, if you're one of those people who, who like me, doesn't like to write naked. Um, <laughs> or in your pajamas, yeah. In your pajamas or whatever. But that is what you do first, is you do the work first. Because the only person who is your boss when you're doing this is you. And I am the worst boss I have ever had. I am a mean <laughs> bastard. <laughs> yes. Yep. I fling myself into this and I do not give myself time off and I I work harder for myself than I ever worked for anybody and I was a yep. really good employee. I worked my ass off for other I'm, people. I'm very but, much like you. Yeah, you are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I worked for I really worked hard for other people, but I work harder for myself. Um so but the thing is, you while you are finding your sea legs while you still have a job, while you still have money coming in and you are getting your butt in the chair every day and you are writing your words every day and you are making the time because you will not find time. Nobody finds time. You have to make time. Um, While you are making time to do this, there are some things that you really need to do now. And this is where we get to the financial shit. The first thing you do is you eliminate debt. And that means um, it, there, there are two directions from which you eliminate debt. You eliminate the debt you owe and you don't incur new debt. So this means you pay off whatever it is that you owe um, or you pay it down. Um, and one of the things that I discovered really early on is that when you have debt, like a house payment or a car payment or something like that, it is very important that you get a loan that does not have a prepayment penalty. Because if you pay just an extra 50 bucks a month early and pay it on the principal, the house that you bought with a 30-year mortgage, you can have paid off in 15 years, Um, which is about where we are with the trailer you're living in. (laughs) Yes, almost, yeah. (laughs) So, you know, there is you but but also the other thing is you don't you you pay down your loans early you pay on the principal every freaking month and you live smaller you live you you don't look at the big house if you want to do this for a living and people are depending on you for an income and, and you need to make sure that you're going to be able to continue to pay bills even when the, there are thin months and there will be thin months and there will be thin years. The next thing you have to do is not look at the big house, not look at the big car, buy used. Um, we, have, we have a tiny little car. It's, we bought it used. Uh, we were able to pay cash for it out of the previous car, which we sold to the dealer that was more valuable than the car we bought. <laughs> Um, so we, we brought it home and the dealer owed us money and said, yeah, and they paid up too. They, they, we got that money the next month. Um, you, you look at things like mobile homes instead of, you know, houses, you look at less good neighborhoods instead of nicer neighborhoods. And, and by less good, obviously we don't mean the, the bad violent areas where there's crime or anything it's just you don't look at the the expensive places or the fancy places right yeah right or we, we, you, we live in a decent neighborhood in a tiny condo <laughs> yeah or like like um the place in north carolina the first house you ever bought mm-hmm. it was just a small neighborhood full with uh little two twos or two ones or three ones yeah just small ones. single family homes yeah, with, ours was 975 square feet. 
man, it felt bigger than that, but I was, That's I was because you kid. were little. Yeah. Yeah. But just, just, <laughs> I mean, you can make a happy home. And I want to mention this too, since you're talking about this, I would check out a documentary on, uh, Netflix on minimalism. It is by the minimalists. Um, I would also say go to theminimalist.com, listen to their podcast, read some of the articles. The, and I'll just say this right now, Joshua Fields Mil- Milburn um, can rub people the wrong way, but... <laughs> but Bugs he, the fuck out of me. Yeah, he, he, he <laughs> seems like a, a decent dude, he seems like a good guy, but it's just some of it just kind of... I don't know, but, but the point is, his message is important, and Ryan Nicodemus is more like a down-to-earth kind of guy. He seems like a cool guy. So even if somebody kind of eh, rubs you the wrong way or something, especially as writers, um, give it a chance. Listen to what they're saying because a lot of it will help you realize, like, what do you actually need? And by minimalizing other shit out of your life, including loans, um, Mm -hmm. you can create financial stability, financial freedom, and you make more time for what is important for you. Yeah. And what, yeah. if you reduce clutter and reduce minimalization or, or go into minimalization, and by clutter, I also mean other activities that don't serve you, mm-hmm. then you're increasing the value of things in your life and you have time and you make time for what is valuable. Right. Right. And this, for me, writing and being able to stay home and write, that, that was the best decision I ever made. And at the same time, it was the craziest decision (laughs) I ever made. And it was only by watching my parents build their own business, um, where my dad built a stained glass business when he was in his mid to late 40s, and my mother built her own flower shop when she was in her mid to late 40s. And out of nothing, these these people bought a building um, that had been a Civil War hospital in North Carolina and had it moved to a a street that they thought where it would pick up a lot of business, and it did. And they refurbished the thing. They financed it with credit cards because that was the only financing they could get and uh, paid it down and paid it off and made a a living for themselves. And and he became a stained glass artist after having been an insurance salesman for freaking years. And a missionary. Yeah, well, and a missionary. Oh, God, yeah, and other things. I mean... (laughs) These were not people, my parents had high school educations, and um, they built a a really pretty good life in spite of that. And I have, you know, two years of nursing school in a community college plus a high school education. And uh, I became a professional writer because I beat myself, I, I just decided I was going to do this and then I did it. And education is not the thing. Learning is the thing. And you can learn by teaching yourself. Yeah. And uh, everything that, that I've done, everything you've done, we've, we've taught ourselves. Because, yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is something you can do. It's just, you know, how much do you want it? Because there will be some prices you have to pay. Yeah. It's like uh, anything in life. There's the obstacles that are going to, you say, I want this, then obstacles are going to show up because you are paying attention. And it's mm-hmm. like, okay, well, how do I? How do I get over this next hurdle? It's not, right. oh shit, I'm done. It's like that that thing of, well, if I really want to be an artist or I really want to be a writer and everybody's telling me my, my work is shit, do I just quit or do I keep at it? it it's it's that, that thing right. is, do right. you want it enough? You know, a, a shoebox full of rejection slips, more than 100, um, I had before I sold anything. So this is not, this is not, easy yeah okay this is there there is no easy button for this <laughs> at least if there is i haven't been able to find it um and there is no easy button now this is still hard this is hard but i love it and it's this is the thing that feels to me like what i was made to do and i love this so so this is, again There's stuff in your life that you don't need. I eliminated clothes shopping. (laughs) I go clothes shopping once a year. I go to JCPenney's. I I get their Hudson Bay, Bay, somebody Bay thing. It's cheap. And I buy like 20 shirts and five or six pairs of pants in the size that I am. 
And I wear it for the next two years. Actually, this time I'm on three years for the same set of, of, of shirts. And she needs these... better sizes because she's lost weight. But also, I, I want to yeah. point out, the only reason she buys that many shirts is because of Matt. Because originally <laughs> she was buying less shirts, all in the same color, and Matt got tired <laughs> yes. of it. <laughs> yes, I had, I did. And this allows me to have, have um, my setup where all of the shirts are the same style. But they're in different colors, and they are girls' shirts. They are not men's baseball shirts, which was the other thing that drove him nuts. Um, ugly gray with, with blue shoulders baseball shirts. Like and I style. love them. Yeah. yeah, I love them, and he fucking hated them. So, <laughs> so I got girly shirts. They're cute. They're little T-shirts. They're cheap. And, and I, can, I have the shirts on one side. I have the pants on the other side. I've got underwear in two separate drawers so that you just in the dark. I get up in the morning in the dark, and I yank the first thing off of each side, the right side and the left side of the closet, and pull one thing out of the, each of the two underwear drawers and go into the shower having essentially dressed in the dark, and it's brain dead. It, it, yeah, I do the, not it, have it to eliminates think about decision fatigue because it eliminates one of those decisions that you have to make every day. Yeah, so, it eliminates yeah. four of them. Yeah. Yeah, if you all don't your have underwear to pick out is all the same shit. and all yep. your shirts are the same and all your pants are the same, you just yank the first ones off of the, of the hangers and the first things out of the drawer and you're done. No, I couldn't. I, I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> I've, I've kind of thought about it, but I, I don't want to do that because I like all my little shirts. I have a last podcast on the left shirt. I have a Say You Love Satan shirt. I have a Dunder Mifflin shirt. It's like, no, I love those shirts. So, well, yeah. no, no, no. See, the stuff like that with the, the, the specialty shirts, those go into the rotation. Yeah, because you have a shirt that I, that my art is on and you mm -hmm. bought it. And I know that that one's for like special occasions, which I think right. is cool. But yeah, th that's, and again, this is just an example of one thing that you can do. Right. And, but you figure over the last three years, I have spent $200 on clothes <laughs> in three years because... Because, yeah, that's a place where I can cut because I don't give a shit about fashion. Yeah. I don't. I don't need dresses. And you don't, don't have don't to go to Penny. You can just go to Walmart or right. a Right, you can store. just go to Walmart. Yeah, yeah, it's just I happen to like JCPenney. They've got, they always have girly cut shirts. <laughs> they, they do. Yeah. They always have these really nice, it's St. John's Bay, that's what it is. And they always have these very nice girly cut shirts so that, that they look attractive. And Matt likes them. Yeah, so it's like why I, I don't cut my hair because Tony likes long hair. It's like you make right. compromises in a marriage. <laughs> yes, you do. Yes. And, and you know, he's worth it. So, you know, yeah. I will buy girly shirts and then and, and in bright colors because he likes me in those. Yes. And it's like, okay, cool. I can do that. That's it's easy. Like, it's like Tony puts up with the dreads. He's like, I don't care as long as you don't cut it. And I and I don't want short hair, but I want like a half shaved head because I love that Skrillex look. Oh, I have forever. And he's like, no, you got to give me something. So I'm like, okay, you can eat that. I won't shave my head. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Yay. <laughs> I have this beautiful daughter, and every time she does stuff, I want it. It's like, no. Yeah, yeah no. she likes my mousy brown hair. She's like, it's beautiful hair. It and is. Then I put I in love dreadlocks, your hair. and you're like, oh, no. And then I tell her I'm going to dye it blue, and she's like, oh, no. But you did kind of like it. You said you, you kind of liked that it. it was anime style, and now it's all all different colors. But yeah, pink and purple and, and yep. yellow, and yeah, just it's, it, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but hey, you know, you are my beautiful daughter and I love you. So there we go. So anyway, um, once, once you have eliminated the, your existing debt and you have paid down as, on your loans and you have stopped using your credit cards for anything but emergencies, <laughs> because there will be emergencies and you need to, that's all that is all credit cards are is a source of backup funding for something that you don't have the cash for right then and you won't you know you will not be able to make it without that and that's it that's what credit cards are for yeah like if you have a credit card and your computer breaks and you're a writer that's an emergency you need a computer so thank right. goodness you have a credit card and Sometimes you don't have one. We didn't have one for a long time. Oh God, yeah. There was there were years after we lost uh, the after the 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 second marriage breakup, 
And when we we spent that little period of time uh, homeless, homeless. And living yeah. in a, living in a hotel for a month while we tried to find some place to live, and ended up renting a tra- the, the cockroach motel trailer. Yes, yeah, with all the and, fleas too. Yeah. Yes. Oh my God. And then after that, uh, we ended up moving to to North Lauderdale, Florida. And renting and oh god, oh, and that it, was it, but a it disaster. got better. And then and then the the I remember you had fixed your credit. It had gone great. Mm-hmm. It had gone wonderful. It was perfect. And then a particular uh, publisher, I uh-huh. I won't name it, but if you would prefer to, you absolutely should. Uh, <laughs> decided not to pay you <clears throat> despite for the six fact, months. Yeah, that it was, uh. and and the excuses were all that you know all. Oh, it's in the mail. It's in the mail. But of course, they're earning interest on that, so they're not. Mm-hmm. Gonna yeah, it was working its way through accounting. Yeah, it was. Yeah, some bullshit there. And and that was her also, credit. <laughs> right, and that was the same publisher who, uh, for the third book, said, "Well, um, we're not going to do the seven book series. We're just going to do a three book series, and you're going to have to take a big pay cut on the third book." Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, they were six months late paying me for the second book. And wanted me to take a pay cut on the third book, and I went fuck that, and uh, that was when I started writing nonfiction. And, and I just want to say something fiction. real quick that Holly has not mentioned. Any time she's brought this up, <laughs> every single one of her published books did better than the publisher expected. She never had a flop. She never had a fail, as far as I remember. Mm-hmm. I think well, it was that they they didn't do better than the publisher expected. They did better than her last book. Right. Which is what the publishers should expect is is that there's this growth. But Mm -hmm. they never turned out to be these massive hits, I guess. Right. No, I was always I was always a solid mid list writer. Yeah. Um I never had a breakout novel. Yeah. Yeah. And and to me that is insane where you are consistently creating something that is selling and outselling your previous books. Or the previous book, and then and then they they do mm-hmm. that mid list thing, which we need to have a, an episode on the mid list problem. Right. Well, yes. Yeah. So it is the the bookstores computer model selling to the net issue, and that is something completely different. And it is why I publish indie now, and yay indie. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. So yay indie. what's what's the next one? Because I know we're okay. Yeah. Talking um, a lot here. Yeah, we are. So, okay, so after you have uh, you eliminated debt and, and paid down your, your debt and uh, you're only using credit cards for um, uh, discretionary, you're, you have eliminated discretionary spending and your credit cards are just for emergencies and you are living smaller and you are buying used instead of new with cars and you are buying cheap instead of expensive and you have walked away from all of the, the expenditures, the discretionary spending that you have cluttered your life with, um, and we all do it, then, then, and you are writing regularly every yeah. single day. And you, I mean, and you are getting your words every single day, and you are finishing projects routinely, and you are, you are doing the work even though you are not yet, um, you know, making a full-time living at it, but you are doing the work as if you were religiously then you start looking for repeating streams of income and this means you are looking at creating series fiction instead of standalone fiction Uh, you are doing regular releases you are doing feeder stories that lead back to your main work like little stories i do in settled space that lead back to my bigger cadence drake stuff um that you are you are you are religious about building your world about building your brand your and we've talked about this in other episodes where you mm-hmm. need to own your world you yeah. need to build it needs to be your thing i was going to mention that too is that you suggested something that in the um if i d- had to do it all over again episode mm-hmm. you said that you would probably like you would your main focus would be putting all the stories in one world. You might still write other things, but your main focus would be connecting everything through one world. Right, right. And the fact that I ended up jumping around between publishers, between um, Bain and and, subgenres. And Time Warner and uh, Scholastic and HarperCollins. And and, Tor. Yeah, and Tor. Um, 
where I would, I had these different, you know, mainstream big publishers, but every time you do that, you have to bring in a new world. You have to bring in new characters. You have to come in with something that the other publisher didn't have because we can't sleep with that girl. Um, <laughs> it's like, yes, no, we must have a virgin sacrifice. And, <laughs> and you're bringing in a new readership every time. Every freaking time. So yeah. you're starting over and you're starting over and you're starting over and you're starting over and it will drive you nuts. So if I had it to do over again, but yeah, that's a different episode. We'd already yeah. gone through that. We already went through that did. one, yeah. Yeah, we did. So you, if you are doing this now, figure out the world you want to write in. Figure out the genre you want to write in. Create it the way you want it. Build that thing. Get your stories out. And, and then look again. Repeating income streams, figure out ways to bring different people from different places into this world you're writing, into these stories you're creating, and give them something regular. And regular is really hard. Um, and I'm, right now, be, I'm split. I am all over the place. So I am not even following my own advice because having done uh, this great series that I love, I've got two Caden Strake novels, I've got six stories in the Longview series that ties in with the Caden Drake novels. I am now putting that on hold because I promised a bunch of kids a bunch of years ago that I was going to finish the series that I started. Uh, and a bunch of kids have, who are now adults wrote to me and said, you know, what happens next? And I couldn't do the book until, you know, the, book, the books have now reverted to me. Now I can bring out new editions of Moon and Sun, um, the, Ruby the first key, two, the, the Ruby Key and door. the Silver Door. Yeah. And then, and now I can write The Emerald Sun, and I'm working on that. And it means not writing Caden Strake and but not building not that follow, brand. It's not not following your own advice because you've already said that you would you would write other things. The mm -hmm. thing is, it's, it's an exception to the rule, and it is also you have all of this advice and all of this knowledge now and wisdom because of your past. So this mm -hmm. is something that you worked on in the past that you are finishing. So right. it's, it's not, it doesn't counter, it's not going counter to your advice. It's just shit right. from your past that you have to, that you want to finish. Right. So right. it makes because, sense. Well, I have to know what happens to the cat too. <laughs> I don't know. I have <laughs> no clue. I don't know what happens to Jenna. I don't know what happens to Dan. I don't know. So I have to find out too. And I've been waiting a long time for this book too. Yeah. So that's what I'm working on now. So anyway, you need to also have a backup paying skill. And it, it needs to be something legal. Um, <laughs> you know, you don't want to be out on a street corner in a tight yeah. red dress. Unless you're in Nevada. <laughs> You're in Nevada. Yes. Oh God. Yeah. Go Nevada. Um, yes. So you, um, it needs to be something that you can do when things get tight, because things will get tight. Um, and they will. <laughs> life happens, and uh, the example for this is you have money in the bank, and yeah, you build your savings, and you have a year's worth of savings at your income level at all times in savings as the buffer because shit happens. Yep. Um, you know, and, and that might only be $30,000 in savings because you're living on $30,000 a year because you're living cheap and you're not, you're, you, you, you own your, your, your crappy little single wide trailer. And but it's, you, it, that's not necessarily crappy. Here's the thing. You, you can live cheap and be perfectly happy with your life. Mm -hmm. That's yes. an important note is that, once you eliminate all the clutter and mental clutter and just just shit from your life that you don't need and you start living within your means, which is important, and you start mm -hmm. living and doing the things that you love, life is amazing. You don't need, you know, the to, to – I hate this term, but keeping up with the Joneses. You don't need that kind of shit. You don't need the newest iPhone or the newest mm -hmm. Galaxy or the newest uh, iPad. I mean, if those things – bring you happiness and value then then yeah there's a difference to that but you can be happy and not have excessive stuff i love my life i love my life but i live a very simple life 
we don't go out to eat. I mean, we have one restaurant we like, and we go there maybe once a month, uh, just because you know the waitresses and the cooks are all really nice to us, and and we we'll, we go there and we have ribs <laughs> or we have a steak or something once a month. You know, that's I I don't go out. Uh, we we don't. We, we don't go do stuff. We don't go see movies. Um, we have Netflix and uh, we have Hulu and we watch stuff together. We play video games together. So, so anyway, it's, uh, we live very simply. Um, we have a cat. We, we, we spend, the three of us spend all of our time together, the, the youngest kid and Matt and me. Um, we don't travel. We don't take vacations. Yeah, but we, you, the, all of this stuff is stuff that you right. love. Because we live, we live our vacation. Yeah. You know, we get to be with each other. And that's, the, so you have to look at this and say, well, what do I want to get out of this? Yeah. And then that's the thing that you make is you, you figure out what it is that you want to get out of this. And then you eliminate everything else. <laughs> I want to say something real quick, too, that we mentioned before. Um, if you are interested in saving a whole bunch of money, I know that groceries are, are interesting. If you want to just give this an ideal, like, try. Read The Obesity Code by Jason Fung. Um, now, this is what we're doing for health. We've lost a lot of weight. I know Mom's lost a ton of weight. I've lost um, almost 50 pounds at this point. But it's not just about weight and health. Um, it's about if you are looking at it as a way to cut down on expenses, I eat every once a day, sometimes every other day, mm -hmm. uh, because I'm doing intermittent fasting and I'm not hungry most of the time. And uh, I know Holly and Matt have pretty much eat once a day now. Sometimes yeah, we, are we all fast. One, one meal a day, and then sometimes we just don't eat at all for a day yeah. or two. <laughs> yeah, or or we'll do like a fast where it's like three or four days, something like that. So it's again, this is not like a diet. It's not you know strict or anything. Mean, it's it's. Strict, it, for but, us, it's just freaking convenient. Yeah. Because you only have to cook once a day. Yeah. And you're saving a ton of money on groceries. Oh so God. again, this is not health. We are not doctors. We are not no. suggesting health information. But if you are one of those people that really, you know, you, you, you're not so much, you, you eat to live, not live to eat, this might be something for you. Uh, so mm -hmm. yeah, just, just if you want, you can look at that. Yeah, that is, that is a very, very nice point. And... And there are other places where you, you have to decide between between what really matters to you and what other people are telling you should matter to you. Yeah. And uh, all of the social crap doesn't have to matter to you. you yeah, you do social not media, owe it. yeah. Yeah, not, um, not even that. Just, I mean, going out and, and partying oh. or going out and hanging with friends or... Well, um, and again, this is all individual based so right. if you have friends like mom matt joe they have family they go see you know mm -hmm. or they hang out with but they are they are living the life they want because it's the, li the life they created i have friends i love to see we go out to biker events uh every now and then i mean now tony's so busy that we miss most of them but um we have things that we love so we make room for them in our lives we're right. not saying do exactly what holly does no we're saying no, no. find what is important in your life and make sure you put the focus on that right because this this writing full time makes it possible to have that yeah the thing the the thing you love not all the things you could love <laughs> but the thing you love that that it gave me being home with my kids while they grew up and it gives me being home with my husband where we just get to hang out together. It's fucking awesome. Yeah. And uh, it's just, there is, there is so little time. And writing full time gives you back your life. Yes. But you have to, you have to know what kind of a life you want it to be. And uh, that does take me back to, okay, so then you are going to save as much money as you can you're going to you you pay off your bills and then as much as you have left over every month that you can you throw into savings and you leave it there and you don't touch it because shit happens and my most recent shit happens was tongue cancer uh for which you know i am down about half a tongue and learning to speak again getting getting my my 
everything to working again was not simple and it hurt a hell of a lot. And I will tell you right now, having, having a half of your tongue cut out, it's way, 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 way worse than childbirth. And I had three and did all three without any anesthesia or anything. <laughs> so, you know, I was there and this was worse. This was a lot worse. It's like Jesse. <laughs> my friend Jesse told me the other day, the uh, she had a knee surgery and ACL and stuff. She's had two kids, I think also without the drugs. I'm not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, she said the ACL, the repairing that stuff hurt worse than childbirth. It's just funny mm-hmm. that there's, there's like, you know. Yeah, it's, because that's it, it your hurt. <laughs> yeah. When you that's your high water mark for pain, and then and then something happens that's worse, and you go, "Holy crap! <laughs> I didn't know anything could hurt worse." But hey. it's not just the tongue cancer either. It was uh, no. your sight failed, and, and the and, sight broke, and uh, and the publishers my, my, didn't pay that one and, time. Yes. So or it, it's yes, <laughs> and you know, so you have to have. Something to fall back on, yeah. And, okay, and back to you have to have a second paying skill. And I put my nursing license on mothballs. Uh, When I made the leap, uh, I had a three-book deal with Bain. And uh, I, on that, on the understanding that I would write those three books in one year, uh, and I would make about $30,000 on those three books, I thought, okay, I can live on that. Uh, and I put my nursing license on mothballs and walked away, quit my job, went home, wrote my ass off and continued to write my ass off, hit my deadlines, um, made, made squeak on money. And then other stuff happened. Yeah. And yeah, other stuff was, you know, my, my, my Becky's brother. Father. <laughs> yeah. The had, child molester, yeah. child abuser. And then the ex- the second ex-husband. The second ex. And yeah, and then <laughs> shit happened and then shit continued to happen. And it was a case of, well, you know, and then we lost, you know, the, my yeah. credit went from really good to non-existent to non-existent for about seven years and then having to build back up slowly. And in the meantime, everything we did was cash-based. And I just want, again, I want to mention something (laughs) else, too. Like, we're showing you that there is no security in this job, but there's no security anywhere. You work for Walmart, you have a chance of being laid off. You work for a company, you have a chance for them to fold. Uh, Blockbuster was doing amazing for the longest time, and they folded. And, And I know that's an outdated reference, but at the same time, there is no guarantee ever in any job Mm-mm. people lose their their job uh, six months before their pension so or before they should retire and their pension comes in so there's no security in life it's it's all about what you value more and if you you value this writing more then this is how holly has lived and this is her advice so right. s- saving saving money um, yes. And you can always talk to um, an accountant. You can talk. You can go online and figure out the best ways to get the highest interest. I know it's kind of boring for some of us, that especially the people that don't like math. It can be really <laughs> intimidating. But just take it as anything else, and you can learn enough about things that you need to to know to help guide you. Yes, it is easier to not spend money than it is to make more money. So... You know, have that tattooed somewhere. And it, it, it helps, is. too, to have an, a supportive spouse if you happen to have one. I know there were times oh, when yeah. Matt would go out and he would get manager positions and he would mm-hmm. earn, you know, like his his half of, of the income while you were earning, you know, yeah. like uh, a little bit less. And, like, I supported Tony for six years while he was unemployed, so now he's returning the favor. Mm-hmm. And I am not a full-time author yet. I am still waiting to hear back from Harlequin. Um, I did get a note saying that, you know, we're, that's just an approximate time. We are still processing this. So it, it, everybody's situation is different. Use what you have in your life to support this. Yeah. So having, having burned my bridges with nursing, and this was intentional. This was, no, I am not going to go back to this because this, it was, it's a job with a shelf life. Um, you know, and I am right up against that shelf life now. I am almost 60. Um, and (laughs) past that nursing is an incredibly physical job. It it requires body strength and uh, a lot of it and stamina. And it is a hard, hard, hard work. And, uh, you know, even back in my early twenties, I was looking at this and thinking, okay, this is not something I'm going to be able to do for the rest of my life. I just can't. So, 
uh, I created my own business with writing fiction. And when things went south there for a while, um, I went to my readers and, uh, you know, on my website, uh, hollylyle.com, and I said, guys, you've, I have been looking at, at my search terms, uh, and the most popular article my, I have on my website right now is how to create a character. I said, do you guys have any questions about that? And I can put together something for you um, about you know, something <laughs> that's, uh, you know, what kind of questions do you have about creating characters? And, and they asked me, my, the folks who read my blog asked me a ton of questions and I used those questions and built them how, uh, uh, create a character clinic. And, um, I put it up as a PDF on my own website. And the day I put it up, I just sent out this little email to the guys who were on my mailing list and money started pouring, Nine ninety five dollars started pouring in. I made over $3,000 that day and sat in the middle of the floor and cried because, <laughs> ah. That was your secondary here. skill though, just yeah, to let you guys that know. That was my secondary skill was yeah. more writing, but that was because this was when the publisher hadn't paid me and we were looking at, at, at not being able to pay the mortgage on the place and my guys came through. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh God. Damn. <laughs> okay. Uh, so A secondary, secondary skill. skill. Yeah. Mine was the Etsy shop and I was still writing, but I was making jewelry and I was selling and, and that supported both us and my uh, ability to try and make time for writing, which I did. Yeah. And, and for me, the secondary skill is that I am very, very good at taking things apart. Yeah. And then understanding how to put them back together again in ways that I can show other people. Um, and that is what I do with writing because from, from the time I was seven and I remember the incident that did this, um, when I was, I was seven years old and it was what, first grade. Um, and my teacher asked a question and I saw, and, and she, this was back when teachers could do this and they, she gave out candy, little tiny miniature candy bars for the people who did a really good job of answering questions in the class. And everybody didn't get one. It was just somebody who, if, if somebody did a really good job, they gave them, she gave them a candy bar. And I had, we, my parents had no money, so I almost never got candy. So I was what we would call highly motivated. Mm -hmm. And she asked the question and I could see the answer. And then there was this other like example that popped in from this other part of my head and I raised my hand and she called on me and I created my first metaphor in demonstrating just the answer and then using that little th thing that this other part of my brain that I hadn't known was there had thrown to me and and I got the candy bar <laughs> and it was this this Pavlovian thing where I saw myself think for the first time in that moment I saw how that worked and I thought, I can do that again. <laughs> so she, her name was Mrs. Hill. And that was, or it might have been Miss Hill. But she was a very young teacher, and she was bribing us with candy bars. <laughs> and that worked for me. I was trained right then. I, I saw myself think. I saw it happen. I knew how to do it, and I did it again. It was, I did it again so often that she stopped having, being able to give out candy bars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were winning the candy bars. <laughs> yeah. So the, you have a skill. You have something that you're good at. And it's something besides writing, or it's something that uses writing, or it's something that you can tie in with this other thing. And you have to have that as your fallback. Because there will be times when if you are writing for commercial publishers, you will not be able to sell anything. Um, if you are writing your own, you'll, you'll hit a bad spot in, in your indie thing where you, you take the wrong direction and then you have to find your way back. Um, and you are going to need a way to make money. Uh, or to, and, and again, the money you don't spend is money you don't, you, you don't have to own or, or earn. So spend less, 
live on less, and create more and be consistent. And, and okay, and then once there, you, you save, you don't spend, and use your secondary skills and keep them sharp. Um, the fact that I can write nonfiction turned out to be a, a huge secondary skill for me. And I started out doing that just as a blog for fun, just because I liked writing about writing. And it turned out to be the thing that saved us. Is there anything else on the the list of? I think that's pretty much it, other than if you're not writing full-time before you quit the day job, you do not have survival skills in place to write full-time afterwards. And that is the biggest thing that I can, that, that, that more than everything else. If you are not writing full-time before you quit, don't think that you're going to be writing full-time afterwards. And this is um, not writing eight hours a day, no. seven days a week, five days a week. She's saying if you're not hitting your words and right. you have a decent amount of words a day. To... Right. You have to create a production schedule. Yeah. You have to know how many books you want to do per year, how big those books are going to be. How um, many, you... uh, um, like m roughly how many hours in a week it's going to take for you to get there. Mm -hmm. And then you create your production schedule. And now... While you're writing, whatever, while you've got whatever job you've got, uh, you also do the writing. And you have to get, if you get up early in the morning, you do that. If you have to stay up late at night after the kids are asleep, you do that. But, but you, this is not something that is going to magically fall out of the sky when you get a, a three book deal or you get a contract with a publisher or you, gonna, or you get anything. That doesn't mean. I'm ready to quit. When you are writing regularly and publishing regularly and you, you have your, your expenses under control and you are not spending a lot of money and you know you can live on what you are earning and you have a backup plan for earning if the writing goes south for a while, then you can do this full time. And this is something that you <laughs> didn't mention before, but you just mentioned now is that you have to be published first. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> you cannot hope before you have started selling things that that you will sit down and get your work out there once you start doing this and people will find you. You have to already know that people have found you. So this is including for indie. Um, yeah. Obviously, you have to make sure that you are selling. So if you're writing stuff and publishing it, but it's not selling, then... Don't do this yet. Yeah. <laughs> you're not ready yet. Yes, you have to have a readership. Because the people who came in and and bought uh, Character Clinic when, when we were just right up against the ropes uh, were my readers. And a lot of my readers, because I focused not just on writing fiction, but I focused on writing nonfiction, and my website was split between writing fiction and nonfiction, and I had done all this stuff, my readers were split between fiction and nonfiction, and it was my nonfiction readers who came in and saved my ass. Yeah. <laughs> and they they're providing the career that you now have your second career my, my second career yeah because yeah. I'm doing both now I write writing courses I teach writing courses and I teach and, and I write my fiction and I get to do both and you know I have the best days man <laughs> I so, write my fiction first and then my my nonfiction second every day so what let's wrap it up in kind of more of a cohesive way because I know that's that's kind of the that's why we put in the takeaways um at the end just to let you guys know because we know we do go off on tangents or we do go into a little bit too much detail so we want to be able to provide you with this list at the yes. end so you remember what we talked about yes so so the, the takeaway here is spend less and get the spending under control get get the debt under control um create rep repeatable income streams where you are building in a world that you have you know that people like and will continue reading and you know go broad with that go you know have have multiple things like cadence drake and the long view and bailey's irish station and stuff that's all in the same world that you can tell tell different stories in different ways and bring in new people at the same time that you are doing stuff that your existing people will like. Have a second paying skill and keep it up to date. 
Um, save, don't spend. Before you go full time with this, have a year's worth of money at your at your no debt at live small level. Uh, you know it, it's tough to get a year's worth of money saved up, but but have that just because shit will happen. Um, and save, don't spend. And then write full time. Write write full time before you even think about writing full time for money. And just have write full time. Published. Yeah. Yeah. You and have and have your readership in place before you quit. And the takeaway the final takeaway on this is would I do it again? Hell yeah. Am I crazy? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's it's, it's kind of a sobering episode, I guess, because a lot of people are going to go into it thinking, well, this is, you know, this is going to be a blueprint. These are step mm -hmm. by step by step, but it's, it's not, it's not. It's, yeah, that's because yeah. you think the, the vision is I am going to sell to a commercial publisher. The commercial publisher is going to love me beyond words. I am going to have a New York Times bestseller. I am going to get filthy rich and famous. That is and one vision. <laughs> that is one vision, and that happens for, you know... The, the, the few grains of sand in the sandstorm that land in the thimble. Well, I mean, and I'm also saying there's some, there's people that think, well, you know, okay, so it's going to be hard work. They understand that. And mm -hmm. again, this is, this is your vision versus my, my unrealistic, is your unrealistic vision versus my unrealistic vision. It's, right. it's, I just think that there's going to be, or I don't because I understand the truth, but my ideal world is consistent work, consistent pay, no problem with any of that can stay with a publisher as long as I want, can publish as many books as I want, and mm -hmm. I earn enough to pay all of my bills and put it money in savings. And that's just not going to happen. So right. it's, yeah, <laughs> I mean, right. it's very, very rare for those those few authors that, that this kind of stuff does happen for. Yeah, so, the, there are folks who have a charmed life. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that if that's you and, and shit just falls into place for you and it works out, that's awesome. And congratulations, well, and, but you and have to if, assume that things will go wrong, and you have to plan for what can go wrong, and and be ready to roll, and to, to keep yourself floating yeah. when things go wrong. So is that everything for this episode? That is everything for this episode, yes. <laughs> okay. So um, again, you can, I, I know we're not real active on social media, but we do have um, two of them. We have an Instagram and, a, well, three of them. We have an Instagram and a Twitter. That's at A-I-A-R-W-I-P. You can always search the hashtag alone with invisible people or alone in a room with invisible people. We have a Facebook page that is alone in a room with invisible people. We have our website, which is alone with invisible people.com. And you can see all of the episodes on there. You can see our show notes. And if you want, you can leave us a comment there. We also have a forum at hollyswritingclasses.com. And you can join. It's a free account. And you can go in and you can hang out with our listeners. You can mention questions. You can mention, uh, you know, your thoughts on topics, your advice. Uh, and we also have an email if you need to reach us. It is show at alone with invisible people.com you can find us on podbean spotify itunes um cast box we're just we're YouTube. stitcher yeah youtube <laughs> we also have a youtube if you prefer to listen that way um so we're all over the place <laughs> the youtube is actually at holly lyle remember to take a look at holly's patreon it's just holly lyle on patreon.com that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com uh, see if you are interested in help helping to support her fiction writing and uh, check out our patreon it is airwhip that is a i a r w i p you can also search alone with invisible people or alone in a room with invisible people and if you are more interested in a one-time support you can go to our website alone with invisible people.com and on the top right there is a place where you can just um support us at a one time it's i think 5 10 and 15 and we've had a couple of people do that and we are very very appreciative we also are still doing the books for itunes reviews so if you and i think we're going to be wrapping this up soon so yeah you know if you haven't done it yet do it soon because it is going to probably end uh i'm thinking january of next year yeah that sounds like a good point 
yeah. yeah. So go ahead and leave us a review on iTunes. Send us, you can send us a screenshot. You can send us your username. We will just go in and verify that that was yours. We have so far verified all of them. So we will know, you know, if it's yours <laughs> and uh, <laughs> go ahead and let us know you left it and we will email you the two books it mom's is squick studies it's set in settled space it's a short story and um mine also a short story is good bones and it is a paranormal story um i believe that might be everything who knows oh we do have a red bubble shop <laughs> if you look look us up we've we've got some coffee mugs and stuff so we have a red bubble shop and i don't remember anything else i need to have a list for the end of this stuff <laughs> <laughs> but i'm gonna say um goodbye happy holidays happy you know happy ho we, we do have a christmas episode but i'm just gonna put this out there now you know because there's other holidays happy holidays uh we wish you the best and um be safe this holiday season yes. and have a lot of fun and try to not be so stressed Yes. And for me, uh, my, my kind of closing note on this is living your dream is absolutely worth the work that it takes. Just understand that living your dream is going to take some work. And now a word from our sponsor. You want to write, you love words, you love fiction, but you don't know where to start or how to middle or where to finish. I do. I'm Holly Lyle, and I've been doing this professionally since 1991. And I know how I did what I did to go pro, and I'll be happy to show you what I've learned. Start with my free three-week flash fiction class at hollyswritingclasses.com.